Thanks for being here today. It's great to have you at New Hope. Uh, I was just handed this book at the beginning of last service. Milo handed this to me. It says my Easter story. Can you see what's inside? <laughs> what this is, this is the musical for Easter Sunday, all right? So they're going to start a week from this Thursday night at 6.30 for uh, Easter choir practice. Uh, I am looking for a 40-voice choir for this Easter, all right? We had 23 at Christmas. I want four. I'm going to make some personal calls this year, all right? Here's the deal, guys. Easter Sunday is the biggest deal of the year for the church. Nothing's bigger. Christmas isn't bigger than Easter. Paul explained it to us this way in the New Testament. If it was not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything else in his life would be in vain. His birth in Bethlehem, the incredible life that he lived, the wonderful teaching that he gave. If, if Easter didn't happen, everything else would have been a waste. And so it is the message of victory, not only for us, but for us to share with our families and our friends and our neighbors. It's the biggest op single Sunday of the year where people who don't go to church show up at church. And so we want to make a statement, not about the pastor, not about New Hope Church. I don't want people leaving here on Easter Sunday morning say, wow, that is such a cool church. I want them leaving here that day saying, wow, Jesus is really who he said he was. Amen. And that message is conveyed from the word as well as from music on that Sunday. And so um, it's going to be easier for you to learn this music than the last three or four we've done. It's been a lot of the last three or four. It's been some of Randy's original work. And that didn't mean it was harder, but we didn't have the uh, CDs that you're going to have with this to learn it on. They'll have a CD for you to take with you. If you can't make every practice, that will be okay. As long as you're practicing in between, you can put it in your car with nobody listening to you and rehearse. All right. Uh, if you really fancy, you can have it on in the shower. All right. Easter is the end of April. The week, uh, the third Sunday of April is Easter Sunday this year, all right? So uh, anyway, uh, a week from this Thursday night, show up at 6.30 right here. Talk to Milo if you've got any challenges. Yes? So what's great about this is it's music we've sung here already. So it's not going to be hard. The, the tracks are going to be great. Uh, glorious day, living he loved me, dying he saved me. Um, my story. If I told you my story. Um, if I told you my great. story. See, even Tim can do it. So there you go. Huh? Um, so, Don't ask me to do that again. That was really, that was the uh, luck of the draw on that one. All right. That's so. Singing. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. So. Uh, all right. Easy to do. All right. So we show up. All right. Now let me draw your attention to the screen and our morning announcements. Hi everyone, welcome to New Hope. We're glad you're here. I'm Jordan Fallsgraf from the High School Youth Group. If you're a visitor this morning, grab that Connect card in front of you and fill it out so we can send you some information about New Hope. And for the members or regular attendees, you can flip that card over for any address changes or prayer requests so we can pray for you. We're glad you joined us this morning. Enjoy the service. Hello seniors, you're gonna to wanna to save the date on your calendars for Tuesday, March 12th. That's our senior lunch, and we'll be celebrating St. Patrick's Day. It'll be a potluck lunch starting at 12 p.m. Good morning, I'm John Longstaff, and I am serving on the Elder Board and also working with the high school youth program. Hi, I'm Madison, and I'm in the high school youth program. We're here to share with you that this is the 23rd-ish Mexico mission we're preparing for, and on March 24th, we'd like to invite you to the pie auction at 5.30 in the evening, right here at Newport. Brittany. Hope Community Church. <laughs> Hope to see you there. I can't see anything. <laughs> it's that time again, and it's men's breakfast on March 9th. Coffee is ready at 7.30, and then we'll eat at 8 o'clock. And this month we'll be hearing from Doug Cockrell. He runs the Abundant Life Ranch out in Sanger. This is a horse ministry, and it has been a positive effect on so many lives. Come and hear about his and his wife's ministry, and eat a great breakfast. See you then. 
March 3rd is our Sunday evening service. This is a family style service and all ages are welcome. This is an opportunity to take communion together as a family, to worship together, and to hear a message this month about loving your enemies. We know that St. Patrick certainly found a way to love his enemy. Come and join us Sunday evening service, 5 p.m., March 3rd. Thing on a sign-up board that's going around, and that is if you want to participate in grief share, if you've had a recent loss in your life, or even if it's not so recent, and it's something that still gives you challenges, and you want to be part of a Bible study support group, uh, it will go starting this week, February the 26th, and run through May the 28th. They'll meet at 11 th- uh, from 9.30 to 11.30 on Tuesday mornings, or if a nighttime works better for you, on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8.30. We've had other sign-ups on other sheets. This is the last Sunday it'll go around. They want to make sure they have enough material for you. So if you haven't signed up yet and would like to participate in the day or evening grief share, please do that today and they'll be ready for you Tuesday and Wednesday. I do want to highlight just a couple of things that you already saw on there, but uh, next Sunday, uh, Sunday evening service, first Sunday of every month, we have a Sunday evening service. Uh, Our associate pastor, Mark, leads that and he is going to be preaching a sermon to you about love your enemies. And what I'm fascinated to hear is he is going to tie in St. Patrick from St. Patrick's Day, examples out of St. Patrick's life into the gospel message of love your enemies. I can't wait to hear how an Englishman talks about an Irishman in a positive way, all right? So that will be, uh, that will be this coming Sunday evening, all right, at, uh, at 5.30. Uh, right after this service next Sunday, we will have a 30 to 40 minute church-wide business meeting. We normally do it this time of year, and it takes care of a couple of things. Number one, we're going to be sharing with you some name recommendations for our elder board, all right? They went through interviews this past week, and uh, the board has a couple of names to recommend to you for approval to join our elder board. It'll be for a three-year term. We uh, also have an update on the barn that we will share where we are. We haven't talked much about our new building project over the last three or four weeks. Um, I will pause to tell you this little bit of information. I think I shared it in one of the services, but not all of them last week. Uh, Our plans went before the planning commission. And uh, while I was gone on the 14th, I thought Valentine's Day was a great day for our project to go before the board. Uh, There was a complaint filed by a neighbor in the area when the uh, letter went out to the neighborhood. Uh, We were able, though I was in Africa, to call and leave a message. And um, she responded with an email the next day after she listened to the message, went to our church website, found out exactly who we were. She said, I'm withdrawing my complaint. You all are not who I thought you were. You are everything that you say on your website. God bless you for your work in Africa. I'd love to meet you when you get back. And uh, she said, I removed my complaint. The only thing I'm going to do is complain to the county until they fix the road in front of your church. It needs to be nicer. So we made a friend, all right? And it passed eight to nothing, all right, at the planning commission. Not one word of complaint or, or opposing vote. Uh, according to Steve Drake, unless we hit any more any glitches, so far it's gone fairly smoothly. We should break ground around July 1st. So we're very excited about that. But we'll give you some more pertinent and updated information on that uh, next week. There are still pledge cards and brochures. If you're newer to our church, want to know about what this project is, there's a picture of it out there in the foyer. Uh, and there are uh, a brochure that explains the project. And, uh, and, and there is a, a, a pledge card there. Um, So we'll update you on the barn and we'll also give you the 2018 uh, completed uh, financial report of 2018 and it's a very good report. So those will be the three things we do next Sunday afternoon at about 12.30. So we'd love to have you come back and join us for that. This past Thursday night right here in the sanctuary we had a 10 year anniversary celebration for Celebrate Recovery. It has been 10 years since that ministry has been going on here. Eric Olson is the one who started it and has led it this entire 10 years. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful evening. So for those of you who are able to join us and those of you who helped serve, thank you so much for making a wonderful statement about that ministry at our church. March the 24th, uh, get it on your calendars. The evening of March the 24th at 5.30, we will be having our annual live pie auction. Uh, what our pie auction is for here
here is for our kids' Mexico mission trip. Our kids have been going for about 23 years to Mexico. For many of our teenagers, it is their first opportunity to engage in a mission activity of any kind. Uh, we made a commitment many years ago when they started it that even though each of the kids are responsible to try to raise some of their own support, they do that through letters, they do that through uh, parents, all right, uh, assisting. But we always say there's finance is not going to be a reason that any of our kids can't go on this mission trip. And so we as a church family, through a monthly contribution to the Mexico Mission Fund, uh, as well as the pie auction. The pie auction is about 50 to 60 percent every year. What we raise at it covers about 50 to 60 percent of the expenses of this trip, which what that means this year is we need to raise between twenty and $25,000. All right. Now, some of you are looking shocked. We've raised as much as 27000 Last year, it was a little over $20,000. Um, how do we do this? If you're new here, let me give you a brief explanation. We ask folks in our congregation to bring their best homemade dessert or main dish. If you make killer beer rocks, we will get a bucket load of money for a dozen beer rocks, all right? They always go very well. If you, uh, if you make a great enchilada casserole, uh, bring that, all right? Um, if, but, but most of it's desserts, but main dishes are also welcome. Um, something like shrimp salad is probably not a good thing. It needs to be something that can either be reheated or frozen, all right? So once we get it home and then we can have it a few days later. Uh, pies, cakes, homemade, always the best. Cookies, uh, and we'll get 100 to 120 items. We will auction it off as fast as we can. I got 20, he'll give me 30. I got 40, he'll give me 50. And we will do that as fast and as hard as we can. There's nothing spiritual about this night except we pray for your generosity at the beginning of it, all right? So uh, if you have a business and you have something that you can give or donate from that business. We do that too. We've had folks donate new bicycles, quilts. Uh, if somebody want, if you work for a travel agency, want to donate a week's trip to Hawaii, we'll happy, happily auction that off. All right. Um, now that's just 50% of it. You provide the stuff for us to auction. The other 50% of that evening is y'all show up and buy the stuff that you brought. <laughs> It works every year this way. I always marvel at it, all right? Um, but if you can't bring anything, but you want to come, do that, please. Here's one of the challenges I gave to our church back in October when we started our building pledge. And that is, this is not a matter of borrowing from one place. Stop, stop supporting the church so you can support that. Stop supporting missions so you can support. This is about sacrificial giving. And so just because we're doing a building project, we don't want to become inward and self-centered. We want to continue to meet the needs that we have in mission giving. This is one of those occasions. So here's the deal. If you're either new to New Hope or you've never been to a pie auction before, why don't you consider coming? Even if you can't stay the whole time, you can only come for half an hour. If we have 50 more people this year than we've ever had before, it'll be a piece of cake. And then we, excuse the pun, and, 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 and then it's spread across, all right? So instead of some folks, we sort of feel compelled to buy seven or eight items. If there's 50 more folks, now we only have to maybe buy four or five items because you're buying one and you're buying one. And so it just spreads it out. If, if you don't have kids or grandkids in it this year, come support somebody else's kid or grandkid in it this year. If you got a grandkid or a kid in it, by all means, show up this year. Uh, and if you just can't make it because you're going to be gone, send a check and don't get anything. That'll be okay too. <laughs> we'll take that. Uh, so anyway, I think I've covered that well enough. Let me give you a couple of uh, prayer requests. Um, Dalton Pittman, he might be one of the youngest part of our congregation. He's three years old, and he had to have abdominal surgery this past Friday at Fresno Community Hospital. He's still there, and hopefully we'll go home this afternoon or at the latest tomorrow. Marge Tharp, one of our seniors who is not able to attend anymore because she has gone completely deaf and can't hear anymore. Uh, she uh, fractured her hip. And so has had to have some hip repair, not a replacement, but some repair. She is recuperating. Uh, they don't hold her very long at Kaiser with hip surgery. She's already been moved to a, um, to a rehab care facility, and I don't know which one yet. Um, my cousin by marriage, Shelly's husband, his name is David, and uh, David had 
cancer of the throat, and they removed a mass, and he was doing really, really well, but the cancer is back. He'll be going to Stanford this week. Uh, he has an abscess and a rash, and so they're going to try to get everything figured out, and this week establish his course of treatment. So please remember to pray for him. Uh, Randy, our keyboardist, his daughter-in-law, as you know, uh, had some real health issues. She lives up in Alaska. Her husband, their son, uh, serves in the military and was, uh, was over in the Middle East. They brought him home, so that's good news. He's home with his wife right now, number two. They've discovered what the issues are. She had meningitis. That has been treated, and she's past that stage. She also has a tumor on her pituitary gland, and so now they are figuring out the best way to treat that. So there's good news, and there's ongoing prayer concerns for them, so please remember them. Uh, Irma McGuinn was in church today, and her and Jeannie Stargis, two women in our church who've gone through cancer treatment, and they have gotten the news that their cancer is currently gone. All right? It's as good a report as you can get from them, and we are so grateful. Continue to pray for Dan Sullivan. He thought he was going to be here today, but uh, called this morning and told me he wasn't quite up to it. As you know, he's been through one round of chemotherapy, and uh, it has worked on the tumor. It has shrunk it in size considerably. What this treatment did not do is have any impact on the lesions on his liver. And so they have remixed his cocktail and uh, started with a new kind of treatment last week. Uh, he was told it wouldn't be quite as bad as the first one, and he said they lied. Um, <laughs> And so, but he said, now I know what I'm dealing with and that's okay. So just remember to pray for him as he continues to go through that treatment. I know he would appreciate that very, very much. I'm going to ask our rushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and our offering today. Would you join with me as we pray and we give thanks? Father in heaven, it's great to be your child. It's wonderful to know that we can begin every day trusting our needs to you. It's wonderful to know that we can end every day thanking you for your sufficiency and, and also thanking you for the rest that you will provide to our body, to our mind, to our emotions, to our will as we rest each evening. Father, the desire of your heart is that it becomes a desire of our heart to trust you every moment of every day, whether it's our waking moments or our sleeping moments. Your desire is, is that we come to a place that we understand there is nothing too small and there's nothing too big that we will not put our, trace, our, our trust and our dependence upon you. And so, Lord, I trust in growing measure, we as members of your family will learn what it is to relinquish control of the areas of our life that we try to, try to still hold on to, and that moment by moment, we will depend, trust, and rest in your authority, in your strength, in your peace, in your joy in your direction. Father, we are rejoicing with those who have had good health reports as a result of, of medicine and faith working together in their lives, and we are so grateful for that. There are others who are still going through the process, and we just commit to you their needs. And uh, we, we pray, Father, for those of us who, at this moment, our lives seem to be healthy and seem to be going in the right direction from our perspective. I pray that we'll be sensitive to your leadership of how you want to use us to be of help and hope and encouragement to those who are experiencing challenges in their world at this moment. And Father, maybe for those who've been through challenges like this before and you've got them to this place in their life, that they can be of good help and encouragement to others who are, are living the challenge at the moment. We pray for your leadership together in our lives, that we will encourage one another. Thank you for the privilege of giving today, Father. Uh, you have blessed us in so many ways. Thank you for the privilege of giving joyfully to you. And Father, if there's a hardness in our heart about giving, may we, may we just hold on to that today and um, continue to trust you to bring us to that place where, where giving is a thrill and a joy and a delight. And, and um, your word says you love the cheerful giver. And so, Father, I pray we get to a point where we align our attitude with your leadership and we walk together in that. Thank you for this and so much more. In the incredible name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. I realized I forgot to tell you one thing during life in the church. I told you we're going to share with you some names next week, uh, elder board recommendations. Let me share them with you now so that uh, if you know anything about them that we don't know, you can let us know by next Sunday, all right? But they survived the, uh, the uh, grueling elder board uh, inquisition. Uh, interview this past week. And so um, 
uh, there were five who attended the class and uh, who filled out kind of an application format, and uh, three of them wanted to take it to the next step, and then uh, two of them said, yes, we're prepared now to serve if it's the will of this church body. So the two names that will be presented to you next Sunday, one of them is from our 8 o'clock service, and he will bring the average, he brings the average age of the 8 o'clock service down considerably, and he will have that same impact if he's uh, approved for our elder board. Uh, His name is Brent Sarabian. Uh, Brent has been coming to New Hope for about 11 years. He started when he was 19. Uh, He is now 30. And uh, he is a delightful young man. He is very faithful in his attendance. He volunteers in our children's ministries. He's a supporter of the church. And uh, I think he'll be a, a, a nice young voice representative on our, uh, on our board. And then another one, uh, we'll bring the average age down because he's sort of at middle-aged on the elder board. Uh, ooh, will Doug Cecil get mad if I call him middle-aged? No, he is. That's probably a compliment to him. Uh, Anyway, Doug Cecil, been in our church about seven years, and what a wonderful story of transformation in his life, and uh, it was exciting to hear the details of his testimony. So those will be two names that we'll be recommending to you next week. What I want to do is give you a heads up on a few scriptures we're going to be reading about seven or eight minutes into today's message. So I'm going to give you time to find those at the beginning. So the first passage we'll look at is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians is very easy to find. It's right after 1 Corinthians. So um, it, it should be easy. Actually, it's between the two New Testament books that begin with R. If you can get between Romans and Revelation, 2 Corinthians is right about in the middle. So in a few minutes, we'll be looking at a couple of verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you found that, put your finger there or put your ribbon in your Bible or a tithing envelope in front of you. Use it as a bookmarker. Um, And we're going to flip back to the Old Testament for just a moment, the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah is between Psalms and Malachi, all right? If you get to Psalms, go right. It's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets, though he was a young man when he wrote this. Jeremiah chapter 9. And uh, once we've done that, we're going to flip back to the New Testament again for another couple of verses found in 2 Thessalonians. All right, again, it's right after 1 Thessalonians. If you had no trouble finding 2 Corinthians, just go right a few pages and you will find 2 Thessalonians. So those are the three passages. 2 Corinthians 10, Jeremiah 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, okay? I know you got to use multiple fingers to find those spots, but once you do, you'll be ready when we get there. It is said that King Frederick William IV of Prussia once visited a school and he spoke to the students. He asked them a few questions and he found out they were a very bright group of young people. He asked them as he held up a stone, to what kingdom does this rock belong to? And being as wise as they were and well-educated, they said, the mineral kingdom. He said, great, wonderful answer. He then pointed to a flower that was on the uh, teacher's desk and said, what kingdom does that flower belong to? And again, in great unison, they responded, that's part of the plant kingdom. He said, great. And then he pointed to a bird that was flying by the window of the room they were in. And he said, to what kingdom does that belong to? And they all replied, the bird is part of the animal kingdom. And then in a moment of um, self-loving, he asked another question. See, he was the king. And he looked at the kids and he said, to what kingdom Do I belong? And what he was really hoping for was that they would recognize that he was the king of their kingdom. I suggest to you that's a question we need to ask ourselves, not out of self aggrandizement, but an honest question Do I know which kingdom I belong to? Am I part of the kingdom of man? where it's climb the ladder any way you can? Or am I part of the kingdom of heaven? When Jesus said about his own self, though I, though I am a king, I came as a servant. Are we part of a kingdom where the way up is down? Or are we part of a kingdom where the way up is pulling everybody else down? 
to which kingdom do you belong? And, and, and I think a, an equally important question is once we answer the first question, is to ask ourselves, does anybody else know what kingdom I belong to? If you're part of the kingdom of heaven, does your family know? Do your neighbors know? Do your friends know? If, you, um, if you've never met me before and you hang around me for a brief period of time, you're going to know fairly quickly that I'm quite happily married to Shelly. Not only by the ring on my finger, but I'm probably going to tell you what we've been up to, uh, to a point. <laughs> if you're around me very often, you're going to know that I have two sons and a daughter. I love to brag about my kids. that They're not perfect by any means. I don't ever amplify their garbage, but I do like to amplify their good points. I love my sons. I love my daughter. If you've been around me very long, you're going to be in for a surprise, but you'll probably figure it out because I'm going to tell you about the fact that I really enjoy, on occasions, not every day, not all the time, but I actually enjoy a fine cylindrical object called a cigar. I didn't have this in my pocket before the last service, but one of the members of this service brought me a new fresh one, all right? That I could, uh, why? Because it's something I enjoy doing on occasions with good friends. If you hang out with me very often, you're going to know that I love to talk about my vacations, the one coming up or the one I've just finished. I love good vacations. And what I love most about vacations are the restaurants I get to eat in. I'm going to tell you about the best meal I had on the trip, all right? And uh, in fact, I'll probably show you pictures because I usually take pictures of the good meals that I enjoy. I brag about those things that are important to me, that are meaningful to me, that bring joy and satisfaction to me. So the question is, if I'm part of the kingdom of God and he brings joy and satisfaction to us, are we bragging about him? We need to make sure we're bragging about the right kind of things in our life. Let me give you a few negative illustrations, some, some things we probably shouldn't brag about. There were two men who were bragging to each other about their old military days. One of them said, why my outfit was so well drilled that when we presented arms, all you could hear was slap, slap, click. Very good, said the other guy. He said, when our company presented arms, you would hear slap, slap, jingle. To which the first guy said, jingle? What's jingling? He'd say, our medals. <laughs> there were two men who were very busy boasting to each other about the size of their ranches. The first one was from Kentucky, and the other one was from Texas. You know, if you're comparing size of anything, there's going to be a Texan in there somewhere. And the guy from Kentucky said, I can get in my truck first thing in the morning and drive all day before I reach the other side of my property. To which the guy from Texas replied, you know, I used to have an old truck like that too. <laughs> there were some racehorses stabled in the same stable. And one of them starts to boast, boast about his track record. And he said, in the last 15 races, I've won eight of them. Another one just down the way in the barn said, well, the last 27 races, I've won 19. To which a third one said, in the last 36 races, I've won 28. Flicking his tail nice and high. All of a sudden, they noticed there was a greyhound dog sitting there in the barn listening to him. And finally, that dog perked up and said, I don't mean to boast. But out of my last 90 races, I've won 88. The three horses were clearly amazed. Finally, one of them said, wow, a talking dog. <laughs> last one, and then we'll get back to serious matters. Three boys were boasting about their dads, and it's good for dads to hear their sons brag about them. One boy said, my dad is so fast, he can shoot an arrow and get to the target before the arrow hits it. Second boy said, oh, that's nothing. My dad is so fast, he can shoot a rifle at a deer, and he'll get there before the animal falls. Third boy said, my dad's got both you guys beat. He's faster than all that. He gets off work every day at 4 o'clock, and he's always home by 3.30. <laughs> so if you haven't figured it out yet... Today, I'm going to be talking about boasting and bragging. You see, by what we brag about, others will really know 
what kingdom we are a part of. What we brag about will give them a hint to the kingdom that we're a part of. You see, you and I are not to be boasting and bragging about ourselves, but about the Lord Jesus and us. People should be able to look at us also and be bragging about what they can see God is doing in our lives. So a few questions. Is your faith growing more and more to a point that others notice and brag about what God is doing? Is your love increasing not only for your family, your friends, your church, but as Mark will preach about next Sunday night, is it growing for your enemies, for those who have despitefully used you or abused you? Are you progressing forward in your spiritual health? Are you becoming better in the fruit of the Spirit? Or are you becoming bitter in the acts of your own fleshly nature? Are others boasting about how spiritually strong they see you becoming? Let's look at these three passages I asked you to look up a few minutes ago. 2 Corinthians 10, 17, and 18 read like this. Paul says, but let him or her who boast, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends themselves that is approved, but it's the one whom the Lord commends. Paul's very, very specific here. There's not much to misunderstand about this. If you're going to brag about something and you are a child of the kingdom, you ought to be bragging about Jesus. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24 uh, you got to remember, Jeremiah was a young boy when God called him to be a prophet. He's just a very young man when he writes the book of Jeremiah. But he has some great wisdom. He says, this is what the Lord says. Anytime a scripture verse begins that way, we ought to pay close attention. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong person boast of their strength. Or the rich person boast of their wealth. But let them who boast, boast about this. That they understand and know me, that I am the Lord. Who exercises kindness, justice, righteousness on earth. For these I delight in, declares the Lord. Then back to 2 Thessalonians. Paul, the writer of this, just as he was the writer of 2 Corinthians. Verses 1, 1 through 5. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they were together on a trip. They are writing back to the church at Thessalonica. Thessalonica. And he says, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith, why, why should Paul be bragging on them? He tells us, because their faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. It was noticeable. Others witnessed it. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you'll be counted worthy of what kingdom? The kingdom of God for which you are suffering. In, in these three different passages, there are, are, are three things that jump out. First off, you and I, as part of the kingdom of God, we should be bragging about Jesus. We ought to be boasting about who he is and what he does in our lives. We ought to find ways to connect what's happening in our life to our neighbors, family, and friends that this is God's activity working in me. We have a tendency to like to take credit for all the good stuff. When really, God is the one we ought to be bragging about. The, 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 the second thing that, that I notice in all of this is that um, we ought to be bragging on what God is doing in somebody else's life. When we notice what God is doing in somebody else's life, we ought to be bragging about that. When others see it going on in your life, they ought to be bragging about what they see God doing. And the last thing, this moves from the individual to the corporate, to us as a church. Does the community recognize God's activity? 
in us as New Hope Church. Not, not for the sake of New Hope Church being more popular, being bigger, being more influential, but on the fact that folks recognize God has his handiwork in the activities that go on in and through and from this place. Brian Evans, a Christian author, wrote these words. He said, Christians do not pursue the trappings of worldly self-centered aggrandizement, but instead they look to the Father for all their needs. Such a way of life is counter to the present culture, which places emphasis on personal achievement and self-sufficiency. Faith begins small, and it grows larger and stronger. By trusting God with the small things and watching Him answer, our faith develops. We start to place increased faith in Him and His goodness, giving over more and more areas of our life until it all rests in His hands. It takes small steps of faith to get us to where we'll finally get out of the boat and walk on the water. In the last service, my son and daughter-in-law with my youngest grandson was on the front. He's six months old. Now, he's 22 pounds at six months old. He looks bigger than what his age indicates. But guess what? In spite, he, he, he needs the Daniel plan. Okay? Uh, in spite of his size, guess what? He's still a six-month-old baby. We can't fast-track him to become 21. We, we have a young man in the Mansfield family. We have a young man in our high school group. That dude was 6'1 in sixth grade. Am I, am I exaggerating? I'm look, he was 6'1 in the sixth grade. He's now about 6'2 or 3 or 4. 6'4. When he was in the sixth grade and was 6'1, I wanted him to be in high school. But you know what? He was a sixth grader. Though his height may have been deceiving, it may have made us think that he was older than that, he still acted like a sixth grader. And that's okay. If you're in sixth grade, you ought to act like a sixth grader. Now, when you're 60 and you act like a sixth grader, we got a problem. But you can't fast track people to spiritual growth. A gentleman at our 8 o'clock service had the privilege of leading to Christ in my office. Uh, it's been about 14 or 15 years ago. And he's a strong-willed, independent, pull-yourself-up-by-his-own-bootstraps kind of guy. He's kind of a rough-and-tumble dude. And, and uh, if God had not put him in a situation where he was literally, personally, flat on his back, he probably would have never turned to God. He was ready to take his own life. And he said, you know, I'm going to go talk to that preacher I see at baseball games first. We started doing a Bible study together. And he gave his life to Jesus. Well, when his son, who got a double portion of what the father was like, when the son found out the dad had given his life to Christ, he wanted to butt in and say, we're going to fast track him to spiritual growth. I said, I'm not sure you can fast track anybody to spiritual growth. There are disciplines in the spiritual life that are necessary steps that lead to spiritual growth. And they must be done consistently. Otherwise, we end up stunted for a while. And then we end up doing what the preachers in my generation, when I was a kid, used to talk about. You backslide. You move backwards instead of forward in growth. And so there are some key principles. But, but these are, they're, they're all baby steps. As I thought about baby steps, I remember an old movie that I saw at the theater. Some of you might remember. You remember What About Bob? Any of you remember that movie, What About Bob? It was a funny movie. Uh, had Bill Murray in it. And Richard Dreyfus, hey, remember that? Now, I didn't realize till the eight o'clock service that my spell check on my iPad didn't like the last name Dreyfus. So, do you know what it spell checked it to? Richard Dryness. <laughs> Sometimes he can be boring. All right, um, but Bill Murray, Richard Dr 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 Dreyfus was in this movie, and Bill Bill Murray's crazy. All right, and Richard Dreyfus is uh, a psychiatrist. He's just you know trying to get him through a tough patch in his life, and he's having it. There's one of the scenes I should have had it and shown it on the big screen, but there's one of the scenes where Bill Murray's just not understanding what Richard Dreyfus is trying to tell him. And so Richard Dreyfus is walking around his office and he goes by his library. He looks up, he sees a book. He said, ah, here it is. This is what you need to understand. And he pulls the book off the shelf and in big letters on the book, it says, baby steps. And he says, Bill Murray, what you got to do to get out of this predicament you're in? He said, it's, it's baby steps. It's not instant. It's and he said, let me explain it like this to you, Bill. He said, to leave my office, you have to take baby steps. 
And he said, when you get outside my door, then you're going to take baby steps to the elevator. And then when you get in the elevator and it gets to the first floor, you're going to take baby steps out. The next thing you know, you're on the street on your way home. Does that make sense? Bill Murray looks at him and says, yeah, I think it does. And he grabs the book and then he imitates his counselor. He takes baby steps out to the door. And he goes out the door and he closes it. And he's gone for about 10 seconds. And then all of a sudden he opens the door back up. takes me. He said, it works. It works. Baby steps work. And I'm here to tell you this morning, baby steps in spiritual growth works. There are five baby steps that are essential for our faith to grow. These are not original with me. They weren't original with Andy Stanley. I just like the terms that he used in his Bible study called Five Ways to Grow Your Faith. They're very simple to remember, and so I'm going to highlight those very quickly for you this morning. You want your faith to grow so that others will know that you're part of the kingdom of heaven and not the kingdom of man, then you need to be engaged in all five of these steps. You might say, I'm good on that one, that one, and that one. I'm a little weak on these two. Then you know where to work on starting this week, okay? First step, you need to be around practical teaching. I'm preaching to the choir right now. You're here. Hopefully what you're hearing is practical. You're to hear, learn, and then apply what you've learned by doing all the keys to growing in our faith walk. You see, the role of a pastor and a Bible teacher is to make God's Word understandable and practical. The key to any message is God wants us to not just know what the Bible says, but He wants us to be and do what the Bible says. There are a lot of folks in this country who have a lot of biblical knowledge, but they have very little application of what they know, and they're not living it out. And what God is interested in us is, is not only knowing the facts, but by faith applying those facts in our own life every moment of every day. The, the second step that we need to be consistently engaged in for our faith to grow is providential relationships. If you probably stop and think back, and it's been fun reading some of your faith stories, and don't stop. If you would like to give me your faith story, there's a sheet out there in a basket in the foyer. It's half sheet. Pick it up, fill it out, drop it off by the office. They'll put it on my desk. You can go online, all right, to the website, and it's under spiritual growth, all right? And under that, click on it and it'll pop up and you can fill your answer in and it'll come directly to me in an email. And next week, I've got a couple of those faith stories that I'm going to share in next Sunday sermon. But all of us have people who have played divine roles in helping us grow in our faith. As I think about my own life, I had no choice that I was born into the Roland family. But I had a mom and a dad who both loved Jesus Christ with all of their heart. And so I had a great start in life. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, I was born on a Thursday in Blythe, California, which is the pit of hell on earth. And I was in church on Sunday, okay? Um, and I've rarely missed a Sunday or a Wednesday since then. I had parents who didn't take me out of force or obligation, but out of a great love for Jesus Christ. Not only did I have a mom and dad who loved Jesus with all their heart, but I had grandparents. My grandma and grandpa McLean, my grandma and grandpa Roland, they both loved Jesus with all of their heart. And when I would pin the night at their house, there would always be spiritual instruction, testimony, example in front of me. My sister and I have heard my dad say numerous times when he grew up in Oklahoma and he'd be playing down in the creeks and the hollers behind the house, he would sometimes hear his mother pray for him as she was down by the creek praying for her family. And she said she would, he, he, he would, she would call him by name and pray for him. Well, I wasn't around when she was down by the creek praying, but I can remember staying at my grandma Roland's house and I can remember hearing her behind a closed door of her bedroom praying for each of her grandkids, calling us by name. Those were divine roles in my life that got me started very early in loving Jesus. But it wasn't just them that God used. There were other people that played key roles in my life. There were men like Malcolm Fry and Jack Williams who came along in my teenage years that helped shape and mold my attitude towards the scriptures and what it meant to be a Christian in this world. There was a short little Englishman who was missing a finger that came and taught a lot here at our church for several years, Major Thomas, who helped me to understand that it wasn't just 
I was to live for Jesus, but that Jesus lives in and through me. And he helped put that together for the next stage of growth in my own life. God brings people in our lives at key moments if we recognize it. And for those of you who are Christians, I I would challenge you, think back about those that have played key roles in your spiritual birth and your spiritual development. Have you ever thanked them? Do they even know? There's a a letter I'll share with you next week that I got a person's faith story here. Um, And she's not here today because she's at the hospital with her son, Dalton. I did not, I've known Brittany since she was a little, I mean Bethany, since she was a little girl. I didn't know what it was that was the impetus to her inviting Jesus in her life till I read her story that she had submitted. And I doubt if the person who led her to Christ knows. He doesn't live here anymore. He lives back in Tennessee. His name's Joel Watson. Joel Watson was just a young man back then. He's now a middle-aged dude with no hair on top. Um... But back then, he was just a, he had been a struggling teenager, battled his faith for a while, got back on track, married a delightful lady. They plugged in and he he taught a a children's Sunday school class. And it was through him that Bethany invited Jesus Christ in her life. I, I can't wait to ask her if she's ever told Joel that because Joel needs to hear that. Even if it's 20 some years later. You see, they were so, they came to New Hope, the, the, the Cox family came to New Hope because they were worried about Corey. She was in high school and she was heading for trouble. She's been trouble ever since. I still worry about her. For those of you who don't know Corey, she sometimes fills this podium when I'm gone as well. And she's uh, one of our small group leaders here. The, the third step of growing our faith. First was practical teaching, providential relationships. Third, spiritual disciplines. Things like prayer, Bible study, engaging in service, that makes our faith grow. We must do these with great discipline and consistency. The disciplines of prayer, Bible study, worship, just like we have to have disciplines if we're exercising, just like we have to have disciplines if we're dieting. Some some of y'all, you know about that. You're doing the Daniel plan, right? Yeah. 105 of you showed up for the first night of the Daniel plan. And 105 of you showed up the second week of the Daniel plan. And then they got to the subject of focus, all right? And 45 of you showed up, all right? You've lost a little focus, guys. Your focus is waning. But a, a diet is, it requires consistency, exercise, budgeting. It requires consistently. Calling your parents after you're an adult, that requires consistency. We have to exercise those things. And when we do, this helps our confidence and our trust in the Lord to grow as he shows his impact on each of these disciplines in our life. Andy Stanley said, discipline is all about doing what you don't want to do right now so you can do what you want to do later. That's a pretty good answer. The fourth thing we're to be engaged in is personal ministry. You guys might be saying, okay, I'm doing pretty good on one, two, and three. How about four? Personal ministry. Have you ever volunteered to do something that you didn't think you were qualified for and discovered that it helped you grow because you were actually engaged in ministry? I can't tell you how many Sunday school teachers of children have told me through over the years, I started teaching Sunday school thinking I was going to impart some wonderful stuff to kids only to discover I learned a whole lot more than they did. As I prepared to teach them, God taught me so very, very much. Maybe it's something as simple as working in the parking posse and being a first smiling face to somebody who enters the parking lot. Maybe it's a greeter standing at the back of the church, actually get to shake the hand and say, hey, thanks for coming. Maybe it's teaching to Sunday school. You know what? Just maybe right now it might be joining the choir. (laughs) Adding your voice to the voices of others, all right? I'm not going to call them out today, but my wife stood by two men at senior uh, lunch last month, and she told me that you two guys who have never, ever sung in the choir sang really, really good. I'm looking at one of them at the moment. It's not Rich Smith. No, just, <laughs> just kidding, Rich. Just, just kidding. Hey. See, one way God helps us to grow in our faith is by putting us in places to serve others for the kingdom. And the result is we end up growing our faith. And the last thing is pivotal circumstances. Life is filled with unexpected surprises. But each unexpected event is a divine opportunity to grow through it. 
Sometimes those unexpected surprises are of a positive nature. It's like you got the raise that you didn't know you were going to get. You got the promotion you didn't expect. Sometimes they're not so pleasant. Sometimes, Tish, they're falling off a horse in an arena, not knowing where you, you are when you wake up in a hospital. Joe, sometimes it's being the one by the bedside for weeks wondering, am I going to get my wife back? Sometimes it's horrible. But every circumstance is an opportunity for us to trust God with our success, with our frustration, with our failure, with our boredom. We can trust Him and we grow. These circumstances that can be trials or triumphs, they can be stress-filled or joy-filled, but these are situations that God can use to teach us that faithfulness brings about confidence in our relationship with Him. C.S. Lewis said the gospel means we can stop lying to ourselves. The sweet sound of amazing grace. I did not tell Tim Kepler I would be mentioning amazing grace in this sermon, and yet what was our last song? This is amazing grace. I did not tell Isaac in our 8 o'clock service I would be referring to amazing grace. And you know what we sang in there? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I love it when God does that. But the sweet sound of amazing grace saves us from the necessity of self-deception. It keeps us from design, de uh, denying that though Christ was victorious, our battle with lust and greed and pride still rages within us. And as a sinner who's been redeemed, we can now acknowledge that sometimes, even as a Christian, we can still be unloving or irritable or angry or resentful with those who are close to us. When we go to church, we can leave our white hat at home and admit we're not perfect but we have failed. God not only loves me as I am, but he also knows me as I am. And because of this, I don't need to apply spiritual cosmetics to make myself presentable to him. I can accept ownership of my poverty and powerlessness and neediness. That's growing baby steps of faith. Let me wrap this up. Several years ago, more than I want to remember now, the movie Titanic came out, the remake of Titanic with what's his name in it? Yeah, that guy. I was always jealous of him. And I got over it. It was a box office smash. People seemed once again fascinated by this tragedy at sea. About 1,500 people lost their lives in that shipwreck tragedy. This great ship was said by some in the media to be unsinkable. One paper the day before that tragic accident even said, God himself could not sink this ship. The Titanic was called the ship of dreams. It was considered to be the best technological ship in the world. So boasted of being the fastest passenger liner on the sea. So how did something so incredible and powerful and wonderful sink? It was because of arrogant leadership who took it at full steam, 20.5 knots, 24 miles an hour at that time, through an iceberg-filled sea. Thinking that nothing could hurt her, they ignored warnings from other ships. They continued on at full speed. They wanted to break a record for crossing the ocean in a large, luxurious ship for her owners, the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, popular known as the White Star Line. Her full name was the RMS Titanic, which meant Royal Mail Ship Titanic. She not only carried passengers, but also mail for the United States and Great Britain. They were racing at a frantic speed to show the world how quick and luxurious she was. She hit an iceberg, and 1,500 people lost their lives. If you study why this ship sank, three reasons come quickly as the conclusion from both the movie and research. Number one, pride and arrogance of the company leaders and officers on board. They ignored the warning of others. Number two, their attitude of creating discontentment. They wanted other people to stop going on other ocean liners that went slower. You don't have to give up speed for luxury. You've got them both in the Titanic, creating a spirit of discontentment. And last of all, there was a lack of respect for the power of nature and God. They didn't think those icebergs could do any damage to their ship. I think 
personal tragedies happen for the same reasons. Pride and arrogance, an attitude of discontentment, and a lack of respect for the power of God in your world and in your life. Let's not experience any Titanic-type tragedies in our life. Let's take baby steps of faith and grow in our relationship with Jesus. Practical teaching, providential relationships, spiritual disciplines, personal ministry, pivotal circumstances will put you and me in a place where we will learn how to brag about Jesus. Others will see Jesus at work in us and brag on him. And the world will recognize the God of the church is alive and well on planet earth. Let's leave here today and choose to brag on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that your word tells us that there is a place for bragging and boasting. It's never about ourselves. It's never about what we've done for you, but it's always about what you've done for us. It's never about what we've done for others, but it's always about what you have done in and through us to meet the needs of others. And Father, if we will brag on you and others will brag on you in us and the world will see the reality of who you are through the activities of a fellowship called the church, then Father, there'll be a turnaround in our world. There'll be a revival in our country. There will be a renewal of personal lives back to the principles of that you know bring peace, joy, and contentment to each of our lives. Father, if we want others to come to know Jesus, we need to let others see Jesus in us. I pray that there will be many of us who will leave here today with the willingness to take baby steps and a prayer that says, Lord, give me courage to brag on you where I live, where I work, and where I play. In Jesus' name, amen. Go brag on Jesus this week.